boom, it's mind pump time. All right, here's the giveaway. Maps Anabolic. I love giving away that program. It's the foundational maps program, and it's the one we get the most questions on. It's also the most popular maps program. Great for building strength, building muscle, boosting the metabolism, raising testosterone levels. It does it all. So here's how you can win, right? Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access. But you also have to subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. One more thing, we have two programs on sale right now. Maps Performance and Maps Suspension are both 50% off. Go find out about them or just go sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code SEPTEMBER50. That's SEPTEMBER50 with no space for that discount. All right, here comes the show. How'd you like sell the Robert Kiyosaki uh, interview the other day I sent over? You know what? It was really good. Actually, I wanted to talk about, and this, this is, is very good. This is connected. I want to talk about a study on muscle and preserving muscle, and it, and and trust me, it's connected to what. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, what you're talking about. Okay. So, there, and I brought this this up briefly on a previous podcast, but uh, seeing people share it more now, so I want to bring it up. There was a study that tested how much volume of training you need oh, yeah. to prevent muscle loss. Okay. So in other words, let's say you gain six pounds of, of lean body mass, right? You gain six pounds of muscle. How much exercise and training volume do you need to do to keep that muscle? Now, previous, I guess, I guess beliefs would be the same amount of training you did to build it. Well, you got to keep doing exactly what you're doing mm -hmm. in order to build it. But we know through experience that's not really true. It's like uh, building muscle is way more challenging than keeping it. And I know this firsthand as somebody who's been working out forever. It's so easy for me to keep muscle as a 42-year-old man than it was when I was 22, you know, working out and doing all that stuff. And even though I was younger and all that stuff, I mean, I do barely anything to keep my mass. And if I want to gain, of course, I have to do more. And I know you talked about the I, same. It was just talking to Katrina about this, who was kind of, you know, be, and I saw the same study, although you're so much better about remembering the exact stats. I, I thought it was one ninth or one. Yeah, it is. Four, is that what it is? One ninth. Oh, I did remember. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yay. Cause, you know, I was telling Give her, and you know, I'm like trying to uh, tell, explain to her what that study was. And it just confirms something that we've been talking about for, I mean, and I have shared it on the show multiple times, how it trips me out where how little of training I have to do right now to maintain. I mean, obviously again, I, I've, and I've said this, I'm not maintaining the bodybuilding physique that I had built, sure. but I would say this, and this is what I was telling her because it was referring to her feeling out of shape right now. Um, and just getting back into it is like your body will respond so quick you'll get back and then not only that you just got to do very little to to maintain to that keep it. Mm -hmm. and i i i believe right now that like so i just came off of not training for a month um and i'm only on week 1 or week 1 of like get back and swing things in 2 weeks time with training 3 days a week i will have i'll be back to a place not great shape but that shape is better than the Highest volume of training I was doing and consistency when I was 24. Yeah, 25. like how much training would you have to do, especially when you were first starting to look like you do now? Oh, well, first of all, I couldn't. I couldn't get to that side. It took right. me forever to even get beyond 200 pounds, right, and have over 175 pounds of lean body mass. Like it took me years and years to get that. But once I got there and had maintained that for several years, now the amount of volume I have to do just to maintain that, which is in better shape than the hardest training dieting version of me yep. at 25, mm. which I know you're going, and I'm hijacked your investing talk, but I totally know where you're going with this conversation. Yes, is, yes. Is Building muscle is an investment. Okay, yes. yeah. totally. So the study showed that, and you, you said it, Adam, one ninth of the volume that you used to build muscle is roughly what you would need to do to maintain it. Now, I- Think about that for a second, by I the know. way. Okay, one ninth? Yep. Uh, if if we typically are saying in a workout you're doing ten sets of something like uh, to in order to yeah you, you know, like one or two sets yeah I know that so that's mind boggling when you think about that like as yep. long as you just go like so somebody who squats ten sets uh, you know throughout the week so let's say three days of right. three to four sets of squatting. As long as that person squats yeah. one or two sets in a week, that should be super reassuring. For people. It's a, that's yeah. awesome news. It is, and and again, I've observed this in clients. I've observed this in myself, and I would speculate that the longer you have this muscle on your body, the less, even less, is required uh, mm -hmm. to maintain it. Like 100%. I, I remember, you know, working with 
older clients who were high level athletes when they were younger. You know, I, I trained a 74 year old man who was a high level boxer, amateur, and then pro boxer in his youth. And I remember like he was, he didn't work out, but he had muscle like a 74 year old that lifted weights. I remember once this uh, guy, this old man came, there, we, my studio used to be next to this breakfast place that was always real popular on the weekend. And this old guy walks in and he was late seventies, early eighties, I believe, little guy. And he sees my kettlebells and he says, can I try this out? And I said, yeah. And he grabbed, I think it was a 50 or 70 pound kettlebell and pressed it overhead. And he had these little meaty forearms and he wasn't necessarily lean or anything, but it was very impressive to see an old man like that. And I said, wow, how often do you work out? And he goes, oh, I goes, I barely ever work out. He goes, but I used to be an Olympic athlete for the Soviet Union back in the whatever days. He had this deep accent or whatever. So obviously he's got this muscle that he's kept. Okay, so how does this connect to uh, Robert Kiyosaki? So <laughs> yeah, he's, I'm curious how you're tying <laughs> this together. He's the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And one of the, and great book, by the way. I recommend everybody read that. Probably mm -hmm. one of the best books that'll teach you how to develop some like financial security and financial intelligence, right? And one of the things he says in there is he kind of just, he, he differentiates the difference between a liability and an asset, mm -hmm. right? So like a poor dad, you know, everything's a liability. A, a rich, his rich dad talked about assets. So what's an asset? An asset is something that makes you income, makes you money. A liability is something that costs you money. So a lot of times people, for example, and again, I'm going to connect it all, right? People own their home and they say to themselves, oh, this is an asset. No, it's not. You're not making any money on your home. Yeah, and not yet, if it's the one you live in. Yeah, and all, it, yes, the value of it can go up, but you're not making that money unless you actually sell it, right? An mm -hmm. asset would be, I own a property, I rent it, that rental income is making me a little more than it's costing yeah, say $5. me. Yeah, say right. $5. Yeah. It, it becomes an asset right there. You, now it's an asset. You rent it out. It's renting out for $5 more yeah, than the mortgage. profit there. It is now an asset. Right. And that's the strategy of really wealthy people. Really, really wealthy people, they understand how to create assets and they tend to have multiple, multiple streams of income and assets and they're very smart at this. And this is how you build lots of wealth. Very few people become wealthy just because they make they have a job that makes them a lot of money. Most people do okay, save their money, and then continue to develop assets that earn them income in over 10, 15 years now, right? So we all kind of understand that story. So how does muscle connect? Well, unlike burning body fat, unlike you know, other, you know, trying to burn lots of calories, you know, through let's say running or cycling, which has its value, so you still have health value. When you build muscle, you have muscle memory. And you have this effect that we just learned in the study that we've all speculated. If you build money, you are literally investing in your long-term health in a similar way that you would do it with an asset. Yeah. So if I gain 10 pounds of muscle, I have a faster metabolism. So now what's happening is like a, like a rental property that's making me money, my body now with extra muscle is burning me more calories. And I'm not necessarily doing anything to, to do that. I'm just right. sitting there. I'm burning extra calories. Not only that, but in the future... Just like an asset, if I buy a property and it's costing me $2,000 a month in uh, in mortgage and I'm collecting $2,200 a month in rent, I'm making $200 income. If I eventually pay that property off, now it's $2,200 in income, right? Mm -hmm. You build 10 pounds of muscle with all this time and effort in the gym and consistency. Later on, very little. It's putting money in the bank. Yeah, very, very little no. uh, uh, effort has to be placed to keeping it to maintaining this faster metabolism. Muscle is protective. It's it's insulin sensitive. So it's literally like building muscle is one of the smartest possible ways you can secure long term health. And so that's why I can, that's how I connect. You know, it's too. hard. Uh, you know, and like investing like that too because it's a it's a long play. Yes. And when you're trying to build the muscle and you're in the thick of it, it's hard to see that. Just like right. investing, right? You're fighting so hard yeah. just to you get want an, the results it, to happen. Right. Yeah. Away. You get a couple pounds. You get a couple pounds that you've worked. You know, the last year or two to get. It can be very discouraging. Mm -hmm. You know, just like only making fifty dollars profit on that property that yeah. you're, you invested in, you know, it's only made you a total of, oh, a couple hundred bucks in a year. Is it really that great of investment? Well, hang in there. Stay the course. Stay the course. Totally. Watch what happens in five, ten years of you of building, working on building muscle on that. And then look how much easier mm -hmm. it is to keep that, maintain that, and potentially make more of that and stay in shape. Just like the, I like the investing so analogy. So this it's metaphor great. is uh, CrossFit Bitcoin. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm just trying to follow you here. Yeah, but it's it's uh, uh, it's beautiful because uh, you know if you had if you examine and I, I mean I must have said I've talked about this a million times. I wrote a whole book based on this uh, theory or not theory. It, what you see with the data and in real life and our experience. If you're Look, if you're the average person and, you know, exercising consistently is tough, which it is for a lot of people, like every day being active, like that's hard. Your normal life is not designed to be active. Everything is sitting down. Everything is convenient. So you have to like structure time aside from exercise. Oh my God, I have kids. I got a job. I have friends. I have family. Okay. I got to look at this for the rest of my life. Like why not? And if you and, and most people only really will do one form of exercise. Ideally, it's like yes, you should probably do resistance training, cardio, flexibility, mobility, yeah. meditate, all these wonderful things. But most people will probably only pick one because they don't have a lot of time. So pick the one that's going to give you the most dividends, right? The most yeah, return. Yeah. So you build some muscle. Oh my gosh, you are really setting yourself up in a way that requires the least amount of effort and the least amount of consistency mm -hmm. and holy shit, you know, let's say you're, you know, let's say you're young and you're watching this, this, this show right now and you're in your twenties and you're like, yeah, I got a lot of time. I can work out every single day. It's fun. It might not be that way when you're in your thirties and forties and fifties, yeah. but if you build the muscle now yeah. and do it right now, now in your thirties, thirties, forties and fifties, eh, I make it to the gym two or three days a week, max. I got kids or whatever, but you maintain a great physique and, you maintain good health as a result, which is freaking awesome. So many parallels there. You That's know? so yeah. many between financial health and uh, you know just your overall health. So yeah, I, I love that analogy. Oh, so and speaking of health, we all did uh, these, um, and I'll talk about my own personal results because I think it's hilarious. So we all did this like this thing for the business where we get life insurance and we do this. This is just to protect the business if something happens to somebody or whatever, right? Buy so they, agreement. They do this whole health panel, right? Mm -hmm. And my just one, and we all we're all healthy, so everything looked good. But my cholesterol numbers always come back. Like, and I eat, I swear to God, a predominant amount of my fat is saturated fat. Mm -hmm. I eat a ridiculous amount of cholesterol. I have six to, to 10, sometimes 12 egg yolks in the morning. I eat tons of red meat, whatever. My cholesterol is always like 149, 150 that's total. Great. That's great. No matter what I do, yeah. it's pretty wild, right? <laughs> yeah, that's great. How much of that is determined by genetics and a lot. activity? Yeah, I mean, the majority. A lot. It's really, really crazy. You know, speaking of studies, so I did my uh, my questions just the other day, and I, I got I was surprised. I got a lot of questions around Jim Stepani, and I'm like, oh, oh my god. god, I'm like. But Man, then I thought an old name. Dr. I know. Integrity. I thought about. It, I was like, you know what? Actually, it's. I think it was like in the. I don't remember. Doug, maybe you could look it up. And like, it was in the probably the first few hundred episodes when we did an episode that where we went straight after him. And I was like, oh man, you guys must have just joined Mind Pump if you're asking me questions about Stepani. And somebody DM me. I get maybe that's why because he's got something that's getting some traction right now because he's and I love what he, he does. He wins too. for the most tatted uh, PhD. Well, he's an example too of why you have to be really careful with uh, with some of these studies because you with can, academia. Yeah, you have because you got to be careful. You could take a study and you could twist it and turn it uh, to serve uh, your your benefit or try and fit your narrative. And or take it so literally and forget everything else. Yeah, right. And then, yeah. Not, and then not think about the all the other variables and factors that come yeah, into play what, what when it comes to. What person's actually going to use your techniques? Well, and so the one the study that he's referencing right now, and I don't know if it's a brand new study or what. It is. Or, it's making its rounds. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's this idea of um, you know super fast like ab work, and we've already talked forever about. You know, when we tell when we tell people about uh, working the abs, it's you know slow down. And cause one of the mistakes we think that a lot of people make is just going through it so fast. They've already got a poor connection to their abdominals. Hip flexors yeah. take yeah. over the movement. They're reinforcing the bad. Yeah. yeah. So they're not even they're not even training the abs very well. So learning to really articulate the spine and use the abdominals to do a, a proper crunch and sit up. One of my favorite exercises, like the perfect sit up, which is extremely slow movement. And here he comes out you know, with the counter information and says that that's the terrible way to do it. Best way to do it is this explosive, fast way of doing it. Now, uh, I didn't have to dive very much into the research to completely dismiss this right away because I really don't give a shit 
if that if the research says that. What I know from training so many people is how impractical that really yeah. is because of the fact that what I just said. Most people have a poor connection to their, their abs and don't know how to properly contract them. You take that same person and you tell them to do something explosive. It's no different than somebody who can't even do a Not body. explosive, a, poor recruitment pattern. It's no, different, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's no different than somebody who can't do a proper body weight squat doing box jumps. It's like you can't even do a proper body weight squat and now I'm asking you to do something explosive onto a box is, is, is a terrible idea. And yeah. this is the same thing. So I, I couldn't see the clip because I was blocked a long time ago, but I was <laughs> able to see the clip through going through the Mind Pump Media account. By yeah. the way, uh, his nickname is Dr. Integrity. If you guys yeah. ever listen to past episodes, wonder who we're talking about. This guy really annoys the shit out of me. And one of the main reasons why he annoys me is because he has the credentials. He looks jacked. So people tend to believe him. And what he does is he takes studies and literally will he'll take them so literally and then give advice that is terrible. This is the same guy that tells people to eat gummy bears post-workout because sugar does this and that. Mm -hmm. Dumb. I don't give a shit how fast you absorb gummy bears. You're telling people who are improving their health and fitness to eat candy post-workout. Like there's yeah, so many could go wrong. <laughs> so many problems. And a big percentage of people who work out also have dealt with insecurities and food dysfunction issues. Same reason why we don't recommend fasting for weight loss, like stupid. Now the study comes out, and what the study showed was, by the way, this is, this is also annoying to me, it showed greater muscle recruitment in a study when they compared fast crunches to slow crunches. Okay. They've shown that in other exercises, and it also doesn't mean a whole lot in the real world. So I could show better recruitment pattern in your quads with a leg extension than a barbell squat. Does that mean leg extensions are going to build bigger quads than a squat? No. No. It doesn't at all. It's not going to happen. It doesn't work that way. So it doesn't really translate. But let's say it does. Let's say fast crunches does work the abs a little bit more than slow crunches. I don't know very many people that can do a fast crunch without completely fucking them up. I don't, yeah. you know, one of the biggest complaints of people who do uh, spinal flexion, this is lumbar flexion. You know, one of the problems, most, you guys know this, back pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hurt my back doing that. In fact, there are movement specialists that actually advocate for avoiding all lumbar flexion. They say, don't ever work your abs, lumbar flexion. We've seen too many slipped discs and issues and stuff like that. Here comes this study, and then you have Dr. Integrity coming out saying, do your crunches fast. What are you doing? <laughs> it's, I, I tell you what, one of the hardest things to, to, to articulate with resistance yeah. is lumbar flexion. It's really fucking – because the difference between – lumbar flexion and hip flexion it's, like here's the difference yeah. in space here's your lumbar yeah and then your hips are literally right here and both of them bend you forward right this is why people who do leg raises and roman chair sit-ups and and they do them wrong i watch them do it and they go but i do feel my abs well they're stabilizing but you're mainly doing hip flexion you're not really working the abs through full range of motion we're gonna make you do it fast now oh my god and by the way 99 percent of people who go to the gym who don't know how to work out when they get on like the the ab rocker machine or they do sit ups on a physio ball, are doing them fast. They're all doing them fast. How many times have you I actually know, sold I training know. to someone? Yes, doing fast crunches mm -hmm. on a physio ball. That's why this is terrible advice. Terrible. And I, I think Doug, you pulled it up. What episode? It was like two hundred and fifty seven. So it was a long time ago. So if you want to hear us talk about, uh, you know, by the way, we were a little bit more uh, rough. Yeah, no, no, yes, this is not, not, we weren't yeah, our best. A little more form. aggressive back. By then. the way, back then, you know, we were punching up, right? So it was okay. So yeah, and yeah, we, reason, were, yeah. we weren't bullying yeah, anybody. Yeah, we weren't bullying we, we anybody. Were we were the little guys authority. that were trying to help the average consumer, you know, get through all this information that they're seeing, and you know, we were discrediting this. This well, on the speaking of that, you just reminded me of something talking about this, uh, discrediting PhDs. Uh, so you guys remember, uh, we get, we got this guy emailed into us. Uh, we get questions pretty frequently about him. I know we addressed it a little bit on one episode. Um, Dr. John Janquish. Does that ring a bell to you guys? Ooh, Janquish. Yes, it does. Janquish? It sounds what is it? familiar. Yeah. Janquish. Janquish. Mm -hmm. He's the kind of buff dude, bald, the bands, the extreme bands claims oh, that, right. claims that resistance training. He only is does a, band exercise. Like lifting was, weights is a waste of time. Yes. Right? Yeah, yes. Is. Okay. Yeah. And again, another PhD that likes to cherry pick data. Data to try and to prove his point. To serve as, yeah. So his Lane sales. Norton went in and destroyed him about two weeks ago. I totally forgot to bring it up on the podcast, and you just reminded me to be talking about Stepani. 
And uh, I wish I would have shared it then because then I would be able to give you guys more information about. But I mean, if you want to go back on Lane's page, you could probably find it up. I think he did it on one of his. He likes to like tear somebody up every Friday, and he just <laughs> he does Friday. He fuck does. Up. I mean, Lane. Lane is. I love Lane. Lane is such an acquired taste, though. Like if you get if that stuff you, you don't like, then you know you won't like his. But he's Lane's a very smart guy. And, uh, and he'll also, you know what? I've, I, he'll also admit when he's wrong. Yes, he, that's why I like Lane. Yeah. I have, I, you know, yeah. and the, the things that most people but he don't can rub like, people wrong. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like him. I like him as a person. We, we, we're all really good friends yes. and stuff like that. We have different approaches on how we do things, but I have a ton of respect for him. Anyways, he just tore. He went in and took every bit of. This is what I love about Lane because he's so detailed like this. Like <laughs> you know, he'll spend like yeah. he, two or three days. This is what he did. Putting so together. he didn't just every say sentence. Like, like, like we're more. I guess we're a little like slow. I, I was just like ah, discredit somebody or, or you yeah. just saw our little run on Jim yeah. Stepani. I'm not going to go. You know where this ends up. Yeah, like, I'm right not going to go in yeah. and like take everything he said and then like pick it apart and destroy. Lane does that. Lane is like, let's take his uh, whole. He did that with Game Changers, the documentary yes, too, and he did that with this dude. He went through every study he's ever referenced to prove his point and destroyed it oh. and showed how he cherry picked the data to try and prove a point and make a leap from here to here and how it doesn't work that way. Then to top it all off. So I'm already laughing as I'm watching. I'm like, you know, we already told this guy to go fly a kite. We would never bring him on. We already said, call this shit bullshit. So then he pulls up his PhD. Look up Doug uh, Rushmore University. So, and this is the thing you got to be careful of too, that you can get it's these- the Harvard of online uh, It's not even huh? that. It's not even, they, they don't even, like watch when you pull up, when you actually Google it, what's the first like three sentences it says about it? <laughs> well, Cayman Islands first. That's the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Uh, uh -oh. It says, as a fraudulent substandard institution, this is a Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board listed uh, Rushmore University as that. Substandard Institute. What does that mean? It means it's that, a very that, popular, fraudulent, freaking way to get you a way to get three letters after your name, <laughs> but it's not really. Yes. Wow. And that is where his PhD uh -oh. is from. So, you know. By the way, I don't a give a buyer shit. Buyer beware. Yeah, I know. I don't give I, a I don't care if it's fraudulent or not when you say stupid shit that's, that's, that's it, fake that's, and not true. Yes. Like, then I don't care where you. It was just it. the icing on the cake. After that, I mean, I well, I watched Lane's full thing on it and just watched him just pick apart every bit of his studies and stuff. And he did it in his story too. And then at the end of it, and then he's like, to top it off, here's where his PhD is. He circles yeah. it since you, I was like, dude, oh, you ooh. have to be careful with uh, academics is in fitness. Not saying that they have no value. I think they have tremendous value, but when they don't uh, apply real world. Uh, like what happens and they don't consider like big context, then it gets really messed up. Like uh, here's an example. You, you, you reminded me because of Lane, right? So Lane's, uh, I think his thesis or what, what he wrote to get his eventual PhD was studying protein. Actually, this is Lane's like, it was more it, it leucine. Was, yes. Leucine. This was, this is his like supreme expertise, right? Yeah. So whenever people try to hammer on protein, yeah. it's like, like this lane is like the man when it comes to this. And there's studies that show that increasing leucine, which is a branched amino acid or protein in general, increases what's called mTOR, so mammalian target rapamycin, I think it's called. And this signals muscle growth. It also can fuel cancer growth, okay? So people come out and saying protein yeah, causes, causes cancer. Causes cancer, just like that. Boom. No. Yeah. If you have cancer, eating a lot of protein can fuel cancer, just like it fuels other cells. So by the way, can eating lots of carbohydrates or a high calorie diet, like- Cancer cells are cells. Yeah. They get fueled in different but similar ways often. And so eating more of amino acids and carbohydrates will fuel it. But in a non-cancerous, non-inflammatory, healthy environment, high protein is very good. And so he, you know, he goes into that uh, quite a bit. I, I saw him do a whole talk on that and I loved it. And then, you know, back to the explosive stuff. I will say this for people who are wondering what's the best way to train my core explosively. It is not by using exercises that are designed to be slow and controlled. Mm -mm. In other words, if you're doing um, like a physio ball crunch or leg raises, uh, you know, one of the worst exercises I hate CrossFit does, by the way, is those leg raises, but they're swinging them like crazy or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I get that that's its own, I guess, I don't know, competitive the bar or whatever. movement. Yeah. But as an exercise for core, it's not, it's not great. If you want to do explosive stuff for your core, don't use those exercises. They're not designed to be used that way. Instead, do things like 
a uh, a chop with a resistance band or mm-hmm. slamming down a medicine ball throwing a medicine right. ball out of a crunch yeah. yes it's if that will give you much more applicable explosive power right, well it, it, let me stop you there too though there's still prerequisites for that 100% so, yeah. so you got to that, that's what you have to as a consumer you have to understand that when you're you're taking in this information that um, does that mean that like I can't get down and get some benefits of explosive crunches? No, sure I can. I also know how to articulate my spine perfect because I've trained this way for a really, yes. really long time. Yes. The average person, no, not so much. Even the average person who thinks they do crunches really well, don't do crunches really. Just because you feel a little bit in your abs, a lot of times just come from the stabilization yeah. and from the resistance on the way back mm-hmm. down. You're not even firing it properly when you get up. You use momentum with your hip flexors to get you up. The way down, you get a little bit of resistance in your abs and the stabilization part of your spine. And so you feel somewhat in your core and abs so you think that you're working them really well. Yeah. This is more common than not. So even uh, if there are benefits like wood chop, well, anything explosive, it's at the it's at the the peak. You don't go explosive until you have control and stability and, and decent mobility. Yeah, you it, just yeah. don't. That's All like that a, stuff first before you even go there. Absolutely. Or if you're going to do something explosive, it's got to be the most regressed, like easy, simple. Like you know, before you go to box jumps, maybe you just like hop. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. on a pad, like For no real. joke, you know, something yeah. like that, right? Hilarious. All right, so we got to talk about Joe Rogan because oh boy, it's making its rounds. So right you know now. what? You know, okay, so I want to say yeah, this he's about, getting lit up. Right how now. dare him talk about ivermectin? Oh, bro! Ooh. Wow. You know what I love about Rogan? Wow. Experimental treatments. I, it's okay. So before you get into this, I, you know, let's. I want to speculate a little bit because none of us really truly yeah. know. Is he? Uh, because now he's paid out by Spotify and stuff like that. Is he trying to like push boundaries to potentially get his ch- contract canceled? And because he regrets maybe doing it, maybe undersold himself, or does he feel invincible because he's being paid by a company and he's not at, at the mercy of sponsors and ads, mm. stuff like that? What's your theory? I, okay, so first off, Rogan's all. So here's the thing: he's always been that way. Remember yeah. he. He yeah. was talking about D- DMT. Yeah, I don't think this is a new Rogan. No, but here's the beauty of it. He's so big and so popular that the tech companies or whoever, pl- it's a big risk to cancel him. Yep. Like, they can't just shut him off. Like, like we're not big. Like, we could say what he did, and we would probably suffer some repercussions. But if they do that to Rogan, he's so big that would cause, not only would it cause waves, but it would might even strengthen his case. Yeah, you know, I can't remember. I, it was one of those articles where I was reading about Spotify. Uh, I, he's responsible for like a big percentage of their subscribers in the last like year. Yeah, that's hilarious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that you're right. Like he's got that much weight. So yeah, so he comes out and he says, "Got COVID, felt shitty, and I did. Uh, I took ivermectin. I did mono. I don't know how to say it, mononuclear something therapy." Uh, did a couple other things. All of these are are not approved yeah. uh, officially by the FDA for treatment of COVID. Now, here's the thing that pissed, that really it's, cracks me up: the, hip, the hypocrisy of mm-hmm. certain people. Right? Mm-hmm. I see people who are like, "Oh, you know, you're going to take a horse." Drug to blah blah blah, you know, and these well, are the, a that's the narrative of the <laughs> mainstream media right now. That's how they attack it. Well, I love fitness people, in particular who, yeah. and there's not a lot, by the way. The fitness community tends to be very skeptical of anything that's yeah. official, whatever. But there are people in fitness who are hammering, oh, take a horse drug. Meanwhile, they'll inject themselves with equipoise, which is a veterinary <laughs> steroid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or they're advocating for ketamine. Ketamine is a horse, horse tranquilizer, yeah. and they'll be like, "Oh, this is you know, I take this, you know, I did this once, and it totally cured my depression or whatever." Yeah. Ivermectin is a drug that's been given to a billion people worldwide over the last four that's decades. A billion, at least a billion. Wow, yeah. one of the most prescribed medicines worldwide, predominantly in India, humans. right? India, yeah, but is Africa. It, now, you know, isn't isn't the leap though? There, because there's there's uh, prescribed uh, ivermectin, and then there's ivermectin for the for the horse, like right? Ve- veterinary grade. So, isn't it's, that what the what it's the, the same drug? Yeah, is it same drug? Yeah, you just, exactly. The, the just, is it just the dosing that's different, or what? It, it, the dosing per pound is identical too, mm. or almost identical. the The difference is the the standards uh, for pharmaceutical is much higher than for veterinary. So. I saw that either Andrew or Doug beat me out when I said it last time. You know, that? I, I told. 
told him to. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did. Come on, guy. Yeah. Why don't you let me be a little Joe Rogan-ish? Because huh? dude, we're not we're not nearly the size. <laughs> Maybe of they'll Rogan. just cancel me. You know what I'm uh, saying? You guys can just be like, no, we don't agree with him. him. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, that's the power of the three of us. Like you know what I'm saying? If one of us goes too far off the rails, we'll just like I'm not. I've been trying to tell Sal he shouldn't be talking about. No, I mean, just like vaccines. I'm not going to. I definitely won't advocate for anything that's not officially approved. But I will say, if you read the the studies that are come that have come out of um, Africa, India, the way that they're using in South America, they are pretty compelling, and it's driving more research uh, here. What's going on? Yeah. So who knows? But <laughs> it's well, funny I've, I've take taken Equipoise before, so I'm not afraid to take an ivermectin <laughs> from horse. <laughs> pretty simple for me. <laughs> it's- hey, I love it when people are like, "I'm not taking that." Horse drug. Here, give me that cocaine. Let's go to the party. <laughs> let me let me take that Molly pill. Who knows what the fuck's in there? Let's take, let's have a good time. It cracks oh, me up. Shit. But it's funny he comes out. He doesn't give a shit. Yeah, because that's like a big like you're gonna well, put yeah. a big target. You see like uh, Fox and CNN now report on him. Isn't that wild? Now if you watch news, which I rarely watch, but news has now become reporting Twitter. And Joe Rogan. Like, that's like news. Yeah. Like, mainstream news now, like, a majority of their content is built around what's trending on Twitter or what Joe Rogan says. That's because old media is dying. I was uh, hanging Je- on by a thread, dude. dude. Jessica and I are watching these People like. People are still paying attention, though. Ugh. Oh, because yeah. you have, you still got to remember, you still have a population. Our parents, right? Our parents uh, that are, and that generation that's still alive. Most of them still. Yeah, yeah television is still yeah. the main source. You get anybody under 30 right now, and uh, more, even if they still watch TV, they'll tell you they get most of their news from Twitter. More people still listen to radio than they yeah. do to streaming, still. But, but is that true? Yeah, it is. Wow. But the growth of streaming and the shrinking of radio is like so fast. It, I mean, well, it's, it's going to be reversed. It's just really bizarre to me that people would rather listen to a politician or like a policymaker than a world-renowned physician, you know? Like, it, it, like why would, like, I don't understand how that shifted, you know, like in terms of like, like how you credit like some kind of information like that versus yeah. like just because of, of, of a mandate. You know what the problem is? I'll tell you 100% here because look, I, you guys know how obsessive I can get about data and back and forth. I mean, it's to a point where it's actually uh, detrimental to my health. Okay. I'm just going to be honest. I get in and I read and I read and I read and I read. Here's the problem. The problem is that these policymakers and the CDC have screwed themselves because they've said so many, they they don't know. They didn't know anything in the beginning. It's obvious. Yeah. And they came out with such, with these like absolute statements, two weeks to flatten the curve. Like, Okay, we, you know, here we are a year and a half or two years later, right? Uh, 99% you're covered, right? Now we know that's not true. Like zero risks. Well, that's not true. There's Now we're seeing very, very low risk, but still there's risks, especially in young males for heart inflammation and stuff like that, right? So they don't know, and the problem is they come out and say all these crazy absolute Yeah, things. they make definitive statements that they have to go back and retract. This is why I learned this as a trainer. I, as an early trainer, I made the big mistake of I would get a new client, and I would make all these promises. Yeah, you're going to lose 30 pounds. Do everything I tell you, and you lose 30 pounds. Yeah, this is definitely going to work. And then the occasional time would happen when it didn't work. I lost all faith. The, cl- the client lost all faith in me. That's it. But if I under-promised and said, look, here's the deal. It's really hard. It might work, it might not, but we're going to move in the right direction. And then they get the results and it surpasses my promises. They have tons of faith in me. So that's the big uh, mistake that they've made and why so many people don't are, are like, I don't know what to believe or whatever. But the data, you know, if you look at the data, it's pretty clear, like so far that for most people, uh, you know, you're better off getting vaccinated than not. That's just a fact. And the data on some of these medications isn't super clear, but in other countries, it seems compelling. Also, you own your own fucking body. Rogan yeah. wants to put whatever the hell he wants to put in his body. It's his, his decision. Yeah. His decision. By the way, I know every, people are like, he's so influential though. And no. You're still an yeah. own your own goddamn body. Well, don't be a sheep. Think for yourself. Yeah, if yeah. he says something. If you want to take the vaccine, take the vaccine. I Dude, if somebody does something because Rogan says it and then they get hurt afterwards and they blame Rogan, like you take no responsibility for yourself. It's crazy. It's yeah. so it's so ridiculous. Think for yourself. Yeah. Speaking of uh, data, I have, I've just read or just heard this. I thought it was really interesting. Um, what do you guys think is the number one predictor of child abuse? Ooh. 
The kid doesn't listen. No, I'm just kidding. That's terrible. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry, bad No, no, seriously, take a guess, because I bet you guys have pretty good educated guess, but I bet you'll be wrong. So what what do you think the number one predictor of child abuse is? Uh, Being in a single parent household? Yeah, I thought you would Well, previous abuse, obviously. Mm Mm-mm. Hmm. Having a step parent in the house. Oh, oh yeah, that makes perfect yeah. sense. Isn't that interesting? That makes perfect. Uh, sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Right after yeah. I'm going, so I, I can't remember the last <laughs> yeah. time I went down a rabbit hole on somebody's content that mm-hmm. I'm just just eating up right now that I really like, and so I'll share it with the audience and you. And I really, I know you're going to go nuts with it too. Uh, the way you pronounce his name, I would say it's like God Sad. So G A D Gad Sad. Gad Sad. Is that I've heard that people say it both ways. God Gad. Yeah. So it's G A. I think he wants to call himself God. Yeah. G A G A. I think I think that's how you say it though. G A D S A A D. And he's a behavioral scientist. Um, I, f- I think he's out of Cornell. I think is where he came from. That's where. But um, really, really interesting stuff. And he, the, a lot of the, the, it was that where I got that from. And I've been going down the rabbit. I hole bet it's. A, I bet it's a majority stepfather um, over stepmother. I would assume. Oh, he didn't say that. I actually he didn't he didn't get into if it was male, female. Just because the that. rate of uh, abuse with with uh, fathers is much higher than with mothers. Yeah. anyway. he but mentioned Cinderella, so that's the opposite there. Mm, yeah, it's a stepmom. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know what? Okay, here's why it makes perfect sense to me. I have kids. You guys have kids. Well, here you know how stressful they are. You know how fucking hard it can be. Now imagine they're not your kid, and mm-hmm. you live with them and everything, and you're not really a good person to begin with. Like the rate's going to be. And they're Much more higher. resistant to you as it actually an outsider. Has, it actually yep. has little to nothing to do with all that. You You're should kidding look at, me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it has more to do with them carrying your genes and not carrying your genes and having mm. to take care for somebody else's child that is not going to carry on your genes. Oh. Evolutionary. Mm. Uh. So there's, there's, and that's why you're, you're more likely to. Now, of course, you know, fighting and alcohol abuse, all those things just escalate that. Yeah. But mm-hmm. the, the the main root cause is that there's no evolutionary reason while you raising somebody else's offspring. You know, you raising your son, part of what part of that is because they're carrying your genes on. When you're raising somebody else's child, you don't have that anymore. So that's why it's the number it's one. That debunks thing. the whole sex at dawn yeah. movement. Yeah. Oh, no, he God. and he gets into some stuff around there actually about that. So you know what? Just a little bit of just to that's what he is. He's an evolutionary behavioral scientist. Just to put a little is. bit of light on this, okay? In the animal kingdom, uh, if you know, like mammals, if they see offspring that's not theirs, it's very likely that they'll kill. They'll just go and actually kill that offspring. So like a lion takes a lioness, she's got cubs, he'll kill it, right? Yeah. Same thing with chimpanzees and humans, as imperfect and shitty as we can be, we're pretty damn amazing when it comes, we're very maternal and paternal when it comes to taking care of our young. So, and I just want to say that because I know it can paint a really na- nasty picture, but we're pretty damn good with our kids, especially when you compare us to any other mammal, uh, you know, in the animal kingdom. No, so, no, of course. Yeah, so. <laughs> but check, I mean, definitely if you have- That's why I say that. Thanks for lightening it up. Sam. I know, that's right. <laughs> Child I mean, one of the things he talks about, about too is Damn. that, you know, th- this isn't information that, you know, people get sometimes get triggered by this stuff. And he's like, when I'm when I'm talking about this, it's not that I condone it or I agree with it. But if you really want to learn about some of the even the most evil and bad things that we do as humans, yeah, what's a lot of times of it? you could tie yeah. it all the way back to evolutionary reasons where that comes from. Mm-hmm. And learning about that, I mean, is only going to make us better as a society. So instead of getting angry about the data and being like, oh, I don't, you know, I, I don't agree with yeah. that. It's like, listen, I'm not condoning it or saying that it's it's yeah. right just because it's just data. Yeah, it's just a data. It just shows that well, that's what a majority do. Speaking of uh, science, this is not really related to that at all. But like, I had a discussion yesterday with Everett about uh, cryogenic freezing, and because we were talking about, I don't know what brought it up, but it was something about like freezing something and then it coming back to life. He's like, can't do that, and I was like, well. Actually, you know, there's actually there's some science there. I don't know. It's somewhat like like science fiction mm. as of now, but there's people that really are trying to make uh, advancements in this direction. But there was an example. I don't know if you guys remember. It was on Unsolved Mysteries, uh, you know, a long time ago in the 1980s. Uh, there was this example of this lady who actually she was 19 years old. So she was a girl at the time, but um, she was in Minnesota where they have like these nights where it's like 20 below and was, was walking back and literally froze to death. And, and her whole body was just like, uh, you know, a stiff block of ice. And this guy found her in that state and, and brought her in 
and she had like you know like like he could tell that there was some life still there i guess there was like some bubbles that were frozen but literally took to the doctor had some uh hypothermia specialist doctor kind of um start to to warm her body back up you know internally and so i uh, i guess like she was, she literally came back from the dead wow uh, what? yes so there's there's another story i thought you were going to talk about something else i didn't know about that one but i did know about this kid who uh, fell through the ice in a, a lake, frozen lake, and was underwater for something like, it was a ridiculous amount of time, like 20 minutes or something like that. And they couldn't get him, couldn't get, you're dead, right? You're in, how long can you hold your breath, right? Plus, mm -hmm. it's freezing lake water. They pulled him out, revived him. Yeah. Revived well, him and well, he survived. I guess, I and, they, guess. and they said it was the cold. The cold is what prevented him from actually. Yeah. You don't need as much oxygen when, when you're frozen. Your body cools down to that state. And so uh, I guess like they figured out too that if they warm, like if they take your blood out and are able to kind of warm your blood oh, first put it back in. and then put it back in, like that's a lot better strategy to then. Because it has to be at the rate of their thawing that they warm your body oh. internally for you to have a better success rate. Because the ice crystals, when they yes. form and they- Right, because they then they'll damage the cells. They can damage the cells. Do you think we're going to figure this out in our lifetime? Oh, they've been working on it. Th well, you know, know. you know viruses, or bacteria, I should say. There's bacteria that'll be frozen for thousands of years that, they've, that they can bring back. There's a frog. That's what I'm saying. Didn't you talked about too, like uh, something being frozen, like DNA being frozen yeah. forever and things like that. Where the so there's isn't there this frog? Maybe Doug, you can find it. There's a particular frog uh -huh. that'll that'll get in mud, and the mud will harden, and I think they can stay in that for state. like months, 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 or maybe even years. Yeah, and maybe. they're and they're and nothing's happening. Their body literally just stops. They just hibernate, basically. and then they come out and they're alive. But it's longer than months. It's not. It's like it's ridiculous. No, I think you're right. Yeah, I think it's like a year, year, two years or so. It's definitely something that is possible, but I don't know. Are we man. gonna figure? Are we gonna figure this out in our lifetime? You know, if you, t you listen to a lot of like, long, it'll happen after the longevity the experts now. and stuff. I don't know if it's <laughs> our generation. <laughs> we'll put either, that one in the race. It's either as well. our generation or our kids' generation coming up is they they predict we'll be li we'll be living to like one fifty. Yeah. That's crazy. You know what we're we're gonna run into with that? Um, okay, mark my words. Housing crisis. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Here's what we're gonna run into. Uh, th if we continue to extend our lifespan over like longer and longer and longer, we're gonna start to run into psychological issues because sure. Or the the what makes life precious. Right. Part of it is it's it, the fact that, that we, there's an ending. Yes. Like. Imagine if we never died, right? Like, like, would you? you yeah. you'd stay married. How to the different same would you live? Yeah, through, but live never, your life? never, never dying and like extending, you know, fifty more years is, I think, a, a uh, total different thing. I don't here. know. Like, think about it this way. I mean, what, made, what's retirement with Social Security? I think it's like sixty-two, right? Sixty-two, you get Social Security. Right. You know when they came up with that number? When when the average, yeah, average life was leaving like seventy years old, like sixty eight. Like we're all gonna pay these motherfuckers yeah. for eight years, no big deal. Yeah. So what do you? So so we all think you retire in your greatest 60s. hustle ever. What are you gonna do if you retire in your sixties? You live to one hundred and fifty. You're gonna re, you're gonna retire and now live another, you know, eighty years or whatever. No, I mean the truth is job. the truth is it, it's going to. But here's the thing though, it's not we're not gonna go from a whole generation only living to eighty to it'll be. It'll be slowly over time. Maybe, right? but yeah. I don't know if these breakthroughs come out fast enough. Well, yeah, that's why I think stuff like this is really interesting. Is like, especially well, well, like when you, you're married. This reminds me of your policy of the contract for marriage, right? Like, yes. it, it, it goes to a certain amount, and then you renew. You, yeah, renew. Somebody shared after not long after we did that podcast. Somebody like shared. Exactly. Somebody shared with me. Some places that actually have put that into place. No I don't way. remember what country it was. Yeah, I wish I remember. You just brought it up. I totally forgot about that. But it was somebody who was like listening to old episodes when I talked about. This was a long time ago, right? When I brought that up. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, somebody was like binging old episodes, and they DM me relatively, like you know, I don't know, maybe uh, two months ago or whatever, and showed me like some somewhere where people so are they trying. I actually. Now that I think about it, I think they were trying to pass it in Florida. Maybe that's where I saw it. So look up, Doug. A lot of uh, old people in Florida. I, yeah. I want to say, I, maybe it was Florida. I think maybe it wasn't another country. Like marriage contract renewal yes, laws? Mar yeah, marriage contract renewal laws and look Florida and see if it's there. Because yeah. now that now that we're talking about it, I think So it, instead of till death do us part, yeah. <laughs> it's like this agreement is good for 40 years. Right. Yeah, yeah. After 40 years, then we have to meet again. And uh, then we have to decide whether or not we want to renew the lease agreement. 
Yeah. I think there's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. And then do you get like, do you have to pay for mileage and shit like that? There's an argument for both sides. <laughs> but I, I just think yeah. like what, okay. So think of you, you guys like in relationships, happy, happy marriage and stuff like that. And, and I'm in a happy relationship. Like, uh, but it would be a healthy exercise in seven years that we had to revisit, you know, that, oh, we're still together. We, right. we want to renew this lease. Well, you people know? renew like, vows and things, and I think that's great. Yeah, there, it, it needs to be a, a thought process of like, have I been contributing my best to you and, yeah. and vice versa? There's a but, reason There's a reason why people renew their vows. I think there's- There is. There's a renewable marriage contract that's see? for two years. See? So after two years- oh, two years? Come on. What, wow. It's going to be like 80%. How can you really assess in two years? I well, I mean, still not bad. You I, mean, could, I mean, you could- Quickly Wait, hold on. The picture is ridiculous. Dude, come on. Why are they the, wearing the one sweater? sweater? There's one sweater. Two people are inside of it. Oh, like, that's just like a blog article. I, I would like push them. I don't yeah. know. That's, that's, the, that's those are me. the kind of people that have one yeah. Facebook page. John and right Sally now. Smith. Yeah. One <laughs> Instagram page. Stop. They're the same ones that are just drinking uh, out of the you know, same straw. Yeah, okay. Uh, you guys are those kinds of people. You know what it is, though? Here's the truth. If I'm married to the same person for 50 years, like you build so much with that person would you really want to be like all right let me go start over with someone else i don't think so i mean no no that doesn't make any i, I, I mean know. you do if you were unhappy for 40 yeah or 50. if it's not working out geez if you've been you for 40 really years just, like you might as like why'd you wait so long i have a lot of people i do, think you man. just turned to like the same person a lot, a lot i mean how often do you hear somebody who got a divorce say like i got it just in time you know most of them go I, I hung around way too long, or I well, should have done that I know. 10 was, years, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, well, I know, because, I mean, I went through that. You, right. You usually, especially if you have kids, you usually yeah. get divorced after you've been thinking about it and, you know. For, yeah, or the for, kids go through school or whatever. You kind of hang around yeah. until that's done. Yeah. Yeah. Ironically, right? Hey, yeah. I want to ask you, Adam, is mm. your sense of taste and smell back? Finally. Oh, it is? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, good. It, and it's it was like a, a slow progression, too, because it wasn't like mm. it was lights went out and then all of a sudden I was back to date. Like, I do remember it was a little over, I'd say a week to 10 days when I started to get like the taste buds back. And then it's been like every day after that, better, better. Like I really feel like today, like my. So here's what, so with Jessica, so Jessica normally loves meat, loves steak, loves ground beef, lamb, like you name it. If it's got a face, she loves eating it. But ever since COVID, ever since recovering, right, her sense of smell and taste has been kind of off and. It's gotten a little bit better, but it's still off. She does she the taste of meat actually is slightly repulsive to her. So mm. what's she doing for protein? So that's I'm um, Organifi. So I'm gonna just bring home uh, Organifi and have her take protein shakes. Like last night we made lamb, which is usually one of her favorite dishes, and I could and she's like powering through it. She's like, I can't. now does she prefer the vegan protein over whey? Is she also like you, where she's got tummy issues with the whey? Well, we're gonna try either one and see which one she okay, likes. Okay, so she can have whey. She can have, I uh, think she can, but we'll see. We'll see how it affects her digestion. Yeah. But uh, I'm gonna start with the Organifi protein and see, because her protein intake is low now and she can tell, she can tell in her energy and everything else, so. You know, speaking of protein and whey and Organifi and our partners, I actually notice when I have, if I'm eating like a lot of Magic Spoon, uh, I'm better off having the Organifi protein. If I'm not eating a lot of Magic Spoon, I can I can totally have uh, one That's because Magic Spoon. you inundate too much of the whey? Like I, I, yeah, because Magic Spoon is uh, dairy protein and whey. That's yeah. the only thing I can think of. And I also normally have more than one serving, so I'm having a pretty, a, a pretty good <laughs> yeah, size. Yeah, I get a big, healthy bowl. Yeah, I get a pretty good size bowl. Okay. Hey, um, do you hold, when you eat cereal, do you eat your, do you hold your spoon normal or do you hold it like this? No, I, I hold it. Limp wristed, yeah, bro. It. No, not limp. Come on, I'm like this, right? So, so my grip. No, yeah, no, my grip is like this. No, dude, I don't. So you don't do that, right? With pinky out. Yeah. That's just yeah. me, then, huh? When I eat, I don't know what it is. I don't eat cereal very often, but when I do, it's a kid thing, right? I grab yeah. the spoon. Like I feel like it's yeah. more fast. Yeah. You like, shovel it. Like yeah. uh, your mom yeah, told you, you have not really to do. weird eating behaviors, bro. That's not weird, bro. Come to my family's. <laughs> yeah. Come to my San <laughs> Sunday dinner. <laughs> hey, I was talking about this with Jessica yesterday. Yeah. We're, we're sitting there eating, and isn't that funny though? how we attach things that aren't weird because it was how our upbringing, right? Because the five people in your household did it, mm -hmm. it's normal. It's mm -hmm. like Katrina and I have this debate all the time when she tells me things about how normal she is with something and how uh, not normal I am. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. because your fucking family raised you that way. It doesn't yeah. mean it's like general population all agrees with Dude, you right here. So we're, so, uh, ex yeah. we, I literally had this exact, que this exact yeah. conversation. Jessica eats, she sits like this. She sits like super tall posture. Very proper. And you can't hear shit when she's eating. And she looks like 
a commercial for uh, I love her for like that, fig by newtons, the way, Jessica. you know, like one of those. You know, mummy, yeah. can you Hopefully give me another she fig rubs newton? Off on Remember that old commercial? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, you yeah. must drive her crazy. Oh yeah, that. so oh yeah, because if she is that Bro, meticulous, no, no, you, you are the oh, opposite. You don't understand. I can't talk though. I'm sloppy. You guys actually just hold on. She'll plug her ears. She gets up sometimes. Hey, she plugs. I'm gonna go eat over here. Literally, she'll plug her ears sometimes. She'll do that. I'm eating. Oh my god, she will. So so she eats like this, all super proper thing. And after meeting her mom and being, you know, hanging out with her mom a bunch of times, I make sense. Her mom's English and she's got oh, that yeah. very English, yeah, very like, proper ways of doing yeah, everything. You, you know, you wipe your mouth like this. Yeah. You don't make. Now, I'm Sicilian, okay? Sicilians, literally, when they eat, men, women, kid, doesn't matter. They are making love to their food. They're yeah. going for yeah. it. It doesn't matter if you're a man, you're a woman. It's loud. Yeah. You're sharing. Soup is all slurped in oh, at once. Yeah. It's like you're just, you're, you're literally having sex with food. It's like, rah, rah, rah. everybody's having a good time. That's why I eat that way. Yeah. So, so yesterday we were having this conversation. I'm like, man, you eat. I'm like, no, I, it makes sense now. You eat like an English person or like, you know, like the stereotype. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you've been to my family function. She's like, oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. I've seen your sisters eat. I've seen your brother eat. I've seen yeah. your, mom, your dad and your uh, yeah. cousins. Like, you guys are loud as shit. You know, when you like, oh. <laughs> now, that's how we do at it. At what point in your life did you realize that or did someone make you aware of that? Because obviously, if you grow up in a home like that, it's everyone's doing it. It's not a big deal. You don't notice it. At what point did it took you- me a while because I would I have a lot of cousins that are my age. So most of the after school people that I would hang out with and stuff were family. But then I had the occasional friend that I became real close with, and then they'd come over for dinner. And it took me a few years to start to piece this together because friends would eat over and then my parents would be speaking Sicilian to each other or whatever. And then afterwards they'd be like, Hey, should I, should I leave? Like, huh? What do you mean? Should you leave? Like, well, you you know, your parents are fighting. Like they're not fighting. They're talking. (laughs) They're like, Oh really? Like, yeah. yeah." Like, okay. And then other friends would be like, Oh my gosh, you guys just yell all the time, like across the house and over. I'm like, we do. And then I go over friends houses Mm -hmm. And I feel like you could hear a pin drop, and it was so strange. Like, why is everything so quiet? So then I started to piece it together. Like, oh, okay, we're uh, we're ethnic. <laughs> That's the difference. Oh yeah, we had to be quiet like crazy. <laughs> hey, real quick, I hope you're enjoying the show. You got to check out LMNT electrolyte powders. First of all, there's no sugar, no artificial sweeteners, and it contains the appropriate levels of sodium for increased performance and better pumps. It's the best electrolyte powder we've ever tried. And if you go to drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump, they'll actually send you a free sample pack. So you'll get one of these here, which includes four of three different kinds of flavors. All you have to do is pay for shipping. So again, head over to drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. First question is from Droggy12. Is it okay to do isometrics on trigger session days or does it mess with recovery too much? Oh, oh, that's great to do on trigger ah, sessions. I like days. this question. Yeah. yeah, trigger sessions are designed just to maintain. Think of it that way, right? You're trying to maintain the muscle building signal that you sent the day before. So you're not trying to create damage. You're not trying to like hammer your body. You're trying to facilitate recovery, blood <laughs> flow, get a little bit of a pump. And then you want to also keep that muscle building signal that you sent because it starts to fall pretty quickly, about 24, 48 hours. And the trigger sessions kind of maintain it higher than normal. Can can isometrics do that? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I love isometrics uh, for for that. I love questions like this. I mean, this uh, the idea always was that the podcast would complement these programs. We always knew that we would never be able to make a program for the masses that everybody should follow and is perfect for their body for where they're at. So there was so much, there's so much more to it. There's so many, many more variables. There's so many different ways that you can do this. And so, but we wanted to give these really solid blueprints based on really good science and foundation in our experience, and then use this platform to be able to guide people to know how to mold it more for them. And like, we talk about the benefits of isometrics all the time. We don't actually have it programmed in some of the, uh, like anabolic isn't got isometrics mm-hmm. programmed in it, mm-hmm. but what a great thing to add to your trigger days. I mean, your trigger sessions are short little 10 minute bouts anyways. You know, you do one or two exercises of isometrics included in there. Awesome. 
Yeah, I've always been passionate in this direction. This is why, you know, decided we all decided to kind of introduce it in Maps Performance uh, as we were programming it just to show, you know, the value of it. And it's another valuable technique that was like a long lost art. Yes. Uh, and, and it's one of those things that, too, you can really manage your intensity and manage the amount of damage you get uh, very effectively, very easily, because it's one of the only ones where you could literally just internally let off. Uh, intensity and it's not uh, dictated by uh, you know the movement quite as much and so too it can also expose you know weak links in the chain where you could really like hone in on those and spend more time you know in the recruitment process which then builds up your overall uh, performance yeah it's um, there's different ways to do isometrics too there's different intensities right so I could do isometrics with just my body in fact uh, in the 70s Bodybuilders would often promote posing in between sets or posing on off days. That's Arnold, still popular. It, it is, right? And Arnold used to do this uh, pre-contest. He did no cardio, did anything like that. And he said posing sharpened his body. Really what he was doing was, that's what posing is, right? It's isometric uh, type training. And you're right. It is a forgotten art. It used to be a staple in strongman, in strongman training. I'm talking about at the turn of the century, like, you know, early 1900s, all the way up until the 1940s, isometrics was a staple part of training. And let me tell you, these guys, and this is before supplements were popular, let alone anabolic steroids, some of the feats of strength that they did today would blow people away. Just incredible. I know Eugene Sandow, I think, did a bent press, one arm with like 300 pounds, and this was mm -hmm. in front of crowds, so he didn't just report it. This was like a legit thing, and they weighed it and tested it. Pretty insane. So there's lots of value, but there's different ways to do it. You can pose or you could push against an immovable object, which is higher intensity and is going to cause more, you know, quote unquote damage, right? So I could flex my quads and squeeze my glutes and that's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be getting underneath the bar and, and push the bar up against safeties and I'm not going to lift the cage. Let's say it's all like, it's too heavy for, to, for me to even move, mm -hmm. but I push against it anyway and I don't move or I get into a push up position maybe put resistance on my back or a bar, push up against you know the safeties again. It's not moving, but I'm pushing against an immovable object. That's a much higher intensity version of isometrics. Also has value, but will cause a little bit more damage. A very simple way to look at this. We've already made the case for why a practicing a movement is so valuable for mm -hmm. like getting good at the exercise, getting the most out of it. All you're really doing with isometrics is practicing flexing a muscle yeah, mm -hmm. in a particular hey. range of motion. That's right. You're, you're, just, you're, you're practicing connecting to it, getting really good at connecting to a specific muscle. And there's tremendous value in practicing that. I mean, that's one of the things that I remember as a trainer, like, wow, how many clients just can't even flex a muscle? Yeah. If you can't stand and, and I can't say, hey, flex your back or your lats or flex your shoulders or flex your tricep, your bicep, and you struggle to connect to one of those muscles, you are not going to get the most right. out of your out of the training when, it, when, you're, when you're training those muscles. I think, too, a lot of people don't even associate, like, uh, in our Prime Pro program, for example, with kin stretch and that whole uh, methodology is isometrically based. So it's yeah. really about, like, getting into end range positions. So uh, a lot of times when we're going through exercises, we're trying to kind of focus on the peak of where we squeeze. Uh, it, whereas, you know, spending time where you're in the end range of that movement has tremendous value as well, because now I can increase the amount of muscles that I can recruit, uh, you know, in the end range, which then kind of you bring that back into that same type of of uh, exercise, now you you have more support, more strength uh, within the entire range of motion, not just the peak. Isn't there, Sal, isn't there some research that's around this? I believe, uh, I think Ben Pakolsky is notorious for talking about this. Um, when somebody has a, a, an underdeveloped muscle that they actually do train and they work out and they can't seem to develop it, I, I, he attributes a large percentage of that to the uh, the ability to connect to the muscle mm -hmm. in the in range in, 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 the, in the squeeze position. Yeah, is that? Yeah, it's hard. And I mean, we saw this as trainers. Like, if I wanted someone to connect to their glutes, I would have them focus on the squeeze position first. The most that would help them connect to the glutes. So he, I don't know if there's any studies to support it. No, I believe there is. Cause I remember he, I think he, I really? remember him referencing okay. that to where he pulled from that, and I, he like almost 
that's it. Like if someone comes to you and says, "Oh, you train all your body evenly, yeah. but your calves won't come up, or your mm. you know your shoulders." Yeah, it's usually a poor connection. That yeah, that's hones he in attributes on. it to that. Is yeah. that you just got a poor connection? So, by the way, uh, I, I forgot about this a long time ago, and I want to tell you, Justin, because I think you think this is super cool. I saw somebody do a home gym setup for isometric training. What they did was is they they in, put two bolts in the concrete, mm -hmm. you know, two loops. And then they would have chains mm -hmm. that they would attach to the bar. And then you could just attach the chains on whatever link on it. So I could get underneath the bar mm -hmm. at the bottom. And it's it's literally anchored into the cement and the concrete. And then do a squat, but I'm obviously in a position. Or do it at a higher position or a higher position. Right. You could do it with curls. You could do it with overhead press even. Yes. I've, yeah, I've seen something very similar I think that would be rad that. to have, something like, to have yeah. something like that in here. Our, totally. uh, our friend uh, Eugene Tao did a, a series when COVID first hit. And I actually, all he used was like a beach towel. Oh yeah, that's old school. Bodybuilders yeah. should do he that. He just used yeah. a, a beach towel and did like this whole little workout of all isometrics with it for the entire body. I thought that was really yeah, cool. Really so smart. yeah, awesome content. Next question is from Sergio Morales Bustillo. How can I progressively overload the overhead press? I've been stuck at the same weight for several weeks. You don't have to always add weight to progressively yeah. overload. What's the yeah. episode number, Doug? What number? We just did this. Nine yeah. things to <laughs> nine things to uh, make ways to progressively yeah. overload. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different ways you could do this. Here's one way: is and we just talked about isometrics. Try this. Take the weight that you're stuck at and just hold it above your head yep. for time, yep. or hold it in the bottom position. Don't rest it on your chest, but actually support it for some time, or put it in the sticking point for time. Or you could take your weight, go lighter, attach a band down. So now you have kind of progressive resistance as you lift. That's another way to do it. You could increase the frequency that you're doing your overhead presses. So rather than training overhead presses maybe twice a week, take that total volume and divide it up over five days where you're just practicing the lift over and over again. Manipulate the tempo. There's a lot of just, you have to change the yeah. way that you're doing the lift and change your approach to see if you can start making some benefits. Here's a simple one. Maybe your rep range has always been the same. So mm -hmm. you're stuck at you know eight reps with 135 pounds. Okay, see what you can do for 20 reps and then just stick to that for a while. Go back to your eight reps later on and you should notice an improvement. Or maybe you haven't like put effort and time in strengthening your stabilizing muscles to keep everything, you know, uh, signaling back to the body that it's snake safe and secure, which mm -hmm. then allows you to drive more force into that uh, specific exercise, which is something I found uh, was a was a key that unlocked even more uh, potential for my overhead press specifically. So doing any kind of rotational movements uh, and things, and like progressively adding, you know, a little bit of load to these rotations to strengthen and support to bring that up because if we're putting all the emphasis on that one uh you know sagittal plane movement uh, then you know inevitably we're not we're not bringing up the supporting cast to to, to contribute I actually saw huge gains uh from this with you Justin um so I I come from more of a bodybuilding style of training and so uh, when I overhead press, or for a majority of my career, when I overhead press, I would do strict overhead presses, and uh, I would get—I got—I can't remember where I was at uh, weight-wise at that time, but uh, I had kind of peaked out, and I really hadn't got that much heavier. And when I train with Justin, Justin loves to do like push presses, where he gets mm -hmm. to use to lose a little bit of English, right? Use your legs and explode, which you could increase the weight quite a bit. Mm. And so what I would do after I trained that with him and I was like, right away, I felt myself get stronger is I would do that. And then I would hold it over my head for yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So I could use a little bit of my legs to explode it up over my heads. And then I would get used to stabilizing, You're acclimating to a higher amount of load. Yes. I would get used to stay. And then we all know that you can, you can on the negative or the eccentric portion of the exercise, the way down in the overhead press, you can handle more load than you can yep. on the way up. So I would, put a lot of emphasis on exploding it up over my head, stabilizing it up and holding it up there for a little bit and then resisting it on a way down mm -hmm. and do like, you know, you talked about somebody who always does eight. I was doing like triples. I was doing triples with significantly heavier weight than what I could overhead press with. I was uh, holding it up above my head and stabilizing and then resisting the way down three sets or yeah. three reps like that. And man, I saw my yeah. overhead press. Something that worked for me years ago was moving away from the barbell and doing only presses with dumbbells or kettlebells sure. and That's get a, really good yep. at using kettlebells and dumbbells and then going back to the barbell and feeling stronger or vice versa. So mm -hmm. 
again, there's a lot, and, and I think oftentimes yeah, there's a lot you can do. People get stuck oftentimes it's just adding weight to the bars. I think is the only way it's, to. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's yeah. just I'm not changing anything. Why isn't Why isn't anything changing? Well, you got to change things before you can expect them to change. So don't just look at adding weight. Look at changing reps and tempos and technique and different methods. There's a lot of different ways you can get the body to progress. Next question is from David K. Silva. Can trainers today see the same financial success you all had without an online presence? Or has the fitness industry changed so much that an online presence is required to be successful? No, well, that's... I mean, I, this will be a good discussion. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I no, have, I, I'll tell you what I think. Okay. I think I, I, I would have achieved the same level of success without an online presence. But with the tools available now... I think I would have achieved yeah. a higher level of success. It could accelerate what you're already doing. Yes. So my success was based around my local community, my local gym, the people that I was in contact with. That hasn't changed. That's still there. Wait There's a still second. people. I, I don't agree with that. I agree. Hundred. That's what I think. I totally 100%. disagree. You I, think I, you think you would have you would have gotten less success today doing the same stuff you did before. Meaning, that, okay. So the way I take this is like someone's asking if we, you don't have an online presence, can you can you build as much? Can you have as much success as we have today? Re okay. Yes, but use no. yourself. I think so. Of course I think, not. I think, I, I not think scalable. I, I, the reason why this business is so successful well, is because there's there's uh, nine different revenue streams. He's not talking no. about personal training. When you were a trainer, yeah, not not not. Well, we didn't no. have any of those things when we were trainers and we were successful. <laughs> no shit. Okay, so, <laughs> so that's why the, that's what the question is. That's why the, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> no, no. Here's the okay. The question literally is: Can trainers today see the same financial success you all had back then? Yes. Got it. Okay. So I today. If I did everything I did before mm -hmm. today, I get the same level of success. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's the difference. Yeah, I agree. The difference now is that there's all these tools, and I would have gotten to the same. Project your message even further. I would have gotten even more success. So it's easier today because of the tools well, to be even more successful. Something that something that it does draw parallels to where we're at in this business too. That's similar to that conversation is that th this business is built on adding value and giving people good results and them and and that be, doesn't change. And, and referral business. I mean, yeah. we have grown the, the show. Root of it all. The show has been grown organically still to this day. We've never paid a dollar in advertising the show. That's right. We st we have never had to go out and promote, put any money into get us in front of more people, which means 90% of the people that come in either one fell like into us somehow and then stuck around or they're most of what you see is someone refers someone mm -hmm. a friend tells them oh my god you have to listen to these guys they give out great free information so and that was a lot of my success as a trainer as a trainer I, what, I didn't do all kinds of, I was I was terrible online. J Justin was much better here as far as building a website and things like that. Um, I didn't go hit the street, hit the pavement and bring a bunch of people to me. And it wasn't like that. It was like, it was if I serviced yeah. the people I had really, really mm -hmm. well, eight out of 10 of them tell their sister, their brother, their yeah. uncle, you got to see Adam. And when you've put enough years behind your, your belt of doing that, you build an incredible referral. And those, by the way, are the best clients, the highest paying, the most consistent are referrals. Getting some random cold lead in, in a business back then, it, it takes a lot more convincing to get that person to stay with it's you and spend a lot of money. So. You got you to prove your methods. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that you got to be effective. That's the first. Yes, that's the very first thing you need to do. And that happens like person to person. And so, you know, that's where you build. That's where you build everything from. And so I, I don't... I, I will argue that if you try to move in the online space before you actually like make that happen, you're not going to be successful. Yeah, that's a rough one. And I'm going to rephrase the question, by the way. Okay, so I, what if I went to good because that lost me. Uh, what if I went to <laughs> uh, what if I went to a construction worker and I said, "Hey, uh, could you still build this house if this was 50 years ago without the same you know technology and equipment?" They'd say, "Well, yeah, it'd take a lot longer, <laughs> but I could do it." Yeah. Um, you know, we have houses that are hundreds yeah, of years point. old, right? So yeah, I would I would get the same success that I had before, but there's so many tools available now that you're it's probably wise to utilize them to some extent. Sure. They exist and they can help. But the but the more things change, the more they stay the same. The same rules apply. Hard work, consistency, you know, tremendous value and service. But now we have all these online tools that can only help and augment that. I'll give you an example, right? So I'd been training people and running gyms in San Jose or in the Bay Area, maybe as far as Sunnyvale, right? But still the Bay Area for a long time. So I had developed a reputation and a name for myself 
in this area, outside of the Bay Area, you don't know who I am. But if you're in the area and you say my name in a gym, at some point, you, a lot of people would know who I was. I just did it for so long and I did a good job. And at that point, I was charging. This is, you know, I don't know how, how long ago, maybe six years ago, right? No, longer than that. Eight years ago, nine years ago. I was charging as a trainer, individual, my single session rate was $150 an hour, which at the time was at the higher end of what a chart a trainer would charge. And I did that through building a reputation and value. After literally one year of Mind Pump, we weren't even big. We weren't even a big podcast. We had a few thousand downloads, not that big. Nobody knew who we were except for the few people that listened to us. I'll never forget, a lady walks into my studio and she wants to hire me. And she heard, she found me through the podcast and I said, I don't have room for clients. And she said, I'll pay whatever. And I thought, $300 an hour, then I'll train you. And she said, no problem. And I, that's when I realized, wow, the authority that you could build through some of these new tools is incredible. So yeah, you can do it, but why? Yeah, but I caution you though, because that's because you it you had years, decades of experience right. that led it up to that. It wasn't like it was just that. That's exactly. right. And yeah. the, and so and I actually, I'm actually writing a post right now. So I've been working on this post right now, going back and forth with our buddy Darren who writes and, and like having him critique and help me. And it's, it's titled uh, The Burnt Out Influencer. And one of the things I talk about in there is uh, false market signals that you receive when you get build this online presence, because so this young generation coming up with these tools that are incredible that help you to scale massive business that can definitely complement and speed up the process of becoming a great trainer. Unfortunately, though, people put so much energy on hacking the algorithm and yeah. getting more people in front of them that they, of course, you get a million people in front of you and you're a personal trainer, even if you're terrible and no one's ever trained with you or everybody that has trained with you has probably not got good results, you could still sell some people. It's so many eyes and so much traffic. Yeah. And at that, and then that's an extreme, right? One million, but put it down to 10,000. 10,000 is a lot. 10,000 people in in front of you. And then all of a sudden you sell two or three or four things and, and you get this false signal that like, oh, I figured it out. I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And so what do you do? You double and triple down on the, the hacking the algorithm and building the social media when really what's going to what's going to build you a long-term business that's going to succeed in any market and any time with any technology is being great at your job and so it's kind of putting the cart before the horse yeah. to focus so much on social media when you still suck at what you do 100%. well yeah i mean think of it this way too like as you're working through all these things and like uh, troubleshooting and plain detective with a lot of different types of, of clients coming in, you know, inevitably there'll be holes in the way that you do things. And there's more education necessary to be able to, you know, meet that demand or, or be able to help somebody at a, at a better level. And to put yourself like way out there where you have, uh, you know, you put like that amount of volume in front of you and you get that many more variables when you haven't actually like been able to figure out a lot of those different types of avatars coming your way. It's going to open you up to criticism. You might do something wrong at a mega scale versus like being able to kind of control that, uh, you know, at, at a smaller scale. Dude, I, I'll, I'll never forget this. There was a restaurant that opened up, uh, I want to say it was in Palo Alto. So really nice downtown area. And uh, I was with Jessica and we saw the sign. We looked inside. It wasn't open yet, right? Because it was a little early. I looked inside. I'm like, oh, this the this place looks incredible. It was new, new restaurant just opening up. We're like, we got to try, and it looked incredible. Like the menu, the ambiance, the tables, the everything. I'm like we got to try this out. It opens up. We go in there, and the food was fucking terrible. Anyway, the, the, it closed down. Right, it shut down not that long after because they had shitty food and they didn't have good service. They had a great surface. They had a great sign. They attracted people, but they sucked. So they're out of business. If all your focus is on social media and online presence and you're a shitty trainer, you're not going to you're not going to succeed. The root the, the base still is true. You have to be good at what you do, provide tremendous service, have people value you, and then the other stuff supplements it. And so that's what I mean by I think I'd have the same success, but I could probably do better because then I could now get even more eyes on me. And at that point, I was already a really good trainer. I was at, here's, here's something, here's a nugget for this person that's asking this question. So I was asked in an interview not that long ago, if I had to, uh, if I was a trainer and I had to start all over, Mind Pump didn't exist, and I began to build this social media presence, what would it look like? 
And I said, I wouldn't worry so much on my social media following. What I would use my social media is to complement my current in-person business. So what my post would look like would be like this. Uh, I get it. I'm, and this is me pretending I'm a new trainer. So I don't know very much. I'm just learning. Maybe I have one certification on my belt and I get a client. Uh, first time I get somebody who has a torn ACL just out of surgery and I got to rehab them. Oh my God, I'm scared. I've never done this before. So what I do, I go home, I start mm -hmm. to research, I get some books on it, or I start Google searching, reading articles on the proper way to rehab this person. Then I take that information from that research and that becomes a post. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I, I am, I'm servicing my current client. So they have now a, a resource to reference back to their specific program. I also may track another person who also is yeah. in that same situation. And I'm not worried about, do I get a hundred followers at 10,000 likes? It's literally to complement my current business. So it's only going to make my current business even more impactful. And mm -hmm. over time, what's going to happen? I'm going to get smarter. I'm going to learn more. And then before you know it, I'm going to have Dude, tons of posts around this. it's okay and yes it's a lot has changed since we were trainers but not a there's also stuff that like websites still existed i know i remember trainers spending so much money and time mm -hmm. and effort into their websites like thousands of dollars to make it look so good and all this money on their business cards and they fail because they were shitty trainers right. i didn't have a website and then when i did have a website it was literally a landing page where you could you know i could contact you and that was it and I was kicking their asses because I was a good trainer. By the, you know, this is a very common question with coaches and trainers right now. In fact, we do coaching for a small group of trainers through NCI. And this has to be the question I, I've, I've heard the most consistently. It's like, what do I do with this online right. presence? And what does this look like? And I tell them the same thing. Like, you know, the more things change, the more things stay the same. Focus on that important stuff first, and then everything else has to supplement. And by the way, if you're if you're watching this and you want to get even more in depth coaching and training, uh, I believe the the page to do so is mindpumpnci.com, and you can go there. And then there's like opportunities for coaching, and uh, this is not something we'll be doing forever. No, this is our men mentorship that we yes. started with Jason Phillips, and it's a you know every every week there is a call where we one cover of, a lot of these topics. One of us are are on the phone talking with Jason, and this is the stuff that right. we get into. Next question is from David GTZ09. What are foods that get a bad rap that are actually generally good for you? Oh, I got a good one. Rice. Yeah, white rice is a good mm -hmm. one. This you know there was a. Hmm. Maybe not so much now, but I mean, for a long time, it was like have brown rice because it's whole grain. There's more fiber. It's better for you than white rice. And although it does have more fiber and it's whole grain and all that stuff, and you know, white rice essentially they take that part off, and it's a little bit more processed. Mm -hmm. The truth is, brown rice is harder to digest. It contains what are called anti nutrients, which actually prevent the absorption of other things. And absorption and digestion is a very important factor to consider. So white rice, for most people, is actually healthier yeah. uh, than brown rice. Not to mention brown rice sucks. It doesn't taste yeah. good at all. Yeah. White, the, ri white rice is like a million times better. Oh, and when you flip too. it around, you look at the labels. I mean, you are like splitting hair difference I on know. the breakdown. Like that's a great point you bring up. But I mean, when, when you, you know what it reminds me of? Another one is uh, chicken thighs. I mean, I, I got sucked into the chicken breast, you know, movement <laughs> in the fitness space. And that's all I ate for decades was just chicken breast. Dry ass yeah, chicken dry breasts. ass chicken breast. And like, as I started to understand nutrition and, and healthy fats, and that all started to come together for me. And I looked at the, again, looked at the chicken breasts and looked at the chicken thighs, flipped them around, looked at the, the things that I was really looking for with the calories, the fat, the protein. I'm like, oh my God. And then when you taste the difference between a chicken thigh versus a chicken breast, it's like night and day difference. So yeah. that's... That would be another one. So would uh, fatty steak. So yeah, how about I was a ribeye or something? Meat. Yeah, in red general, meat gets a bad rap. The bad rap, yeah, because of all the different political motives out there. Uh, but I mean, it's it's a staple food that we've had for ever, you know, and it's something that provides nutrients. It's very bioavailable. Uh, obviously, there's like you know people out there that you know might have a different reaction to. It. There's always going to be individual variances, but you know, for the majority of people. Red meat actually is is pretty good for you. Yeah, and I want to say this. If you're overeating and you're not active, almost any food can become bad. And the reverse yeah. is true. If That's you're right. Un, if you're under eating your calories- You get away with a lot more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's like, you know, oh, I'm eating healthy. This is, uh, you know, this is a natural food. This is bananas and yeah, potatoes. Context and, matters here. And you're like, well, yeah, but you're, you're obese and you're eating way too many calories. So those are all now unhealthy for you. So that makes a big difference uh, as well. 
Um, you know, I, this may be not an issue so anymore, but it was uh, when I was, you know, training people back in the day. Egg yolks. Uh, whole eggs, man. Yeah. Whole eggs or That's organ another, meats. Another for, good one. Yeah. Even organ meat. You know, doctors used to recommend you give this stuff to your kids before they invented multivitamins and stuff. So, mm-hmm. oh, your kid's low in iron. Cook them some liver or, you know, they need more... Of these other nutrients, acid, yeah, yeah. Give them some some egg yolks, and all of a sudden we were thought, you no, know, butter was another one that we thought, you know, was really bad. Here's one that I think people still might think is bad, and a big. It depends on how it's fried. Okay, so the oil that it's fried in, but generally speaking, if your calories are good and you're fit and stuff, uh, pork olive rinds or oh, I was pork- say olive oil is another one that people think because it's an oil, you think it's bad and stuff like that. Oh, very healthy. Right. I think a lot of people know that, but like pork rinds are, I mean, it's straight up, you know, fat skin fried. But if your calories are pretty good, um, especially if you're eating a diet that's really low in carbohydrate and you're trying to go in that direction, it's actually not a bad snack. But there's a there's a difference, right? If you buy the ones that are fried in oils that aren't so great versus ones that are fried in oils that are, you know, I would, I, you know, you kind of just gra- uh, graze right over the uh, olive oil. T- uh, olive oil and butter, I think, are two things that have had a bad yeah. rap forever that I use almost daily that's because we grew up in the well, fat is bad era yeah and they also would would caution about like cooking it uh you know under too high of a temperature that uh, it, it would become you know uh, problematic for for people but i mean the, the, that that minimal term, yeah it's very minimal the effect minimal um here's one salt salt gets oh, a yeah. bad rap oh, yeah, that's still a big one big one today and i'm gonna tell you something except for Highly sensitive individuals with blood pressure issues, uh, where they need to be careful with their sodium. Salt is actually it's not only is it good for you; it's essential. I mean, humans literally fought wars over salt. This is true. That's how important it is for our survival. And when you read studies that look at healthy populations, higher sodium intakes are actually connected to longer lifespan. If you're active and you work out and you sweat and your diet's normally good. Uh, you don't want low sodium. Low sodium in that case actually it can be correlated to uh, worse health outcomes, worse performance, uh, you know, electrolyte issues, stuff like that. That's why when we started working with LMNT, they're an electrolyte company that actually uses appropriate levels of sodium. So if you're drinking electrolytes for the electrolytes, because you're like, I need electrolytes, you want a good amount of sodium. That's the most important of all those electrolytes. Otherwise, uh, it's just kind of, you know, a waste of time. In fact, I think the original Gatorade was way more higher. Yeah, the majority was, was sodium. It was higher in yeah. sodium than they eventually, you know, yeah. because, you know, of course, the no, media yeah. made it sound like sodium super bad. So that's one of my favorite ones. Look, if you like our information, you'll love mindpumpfree.com. We have lots of free guides there that can help you build a more fit and healthy body, burn body fat, improve your strength and performance, even reduce pain mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at mindpumpsal. And Adam is at mindpumpadam.